Catholic students, I see students. Okay, students are here, uh, postgraduate students. Uh, so uh, once again, it is my immense pleasure to welcome today Dr. Michael Burke, Professor of Rhetoric. And uh, this is the third lecture in the series of lectures entitled Anticipation of Joy. And today's lecture will be on the digital uh, technology in literature, how is it entitled? The Evolution of Reading in the Age of Digital Technology. Uh, so, Michael, you're welcome and you're all ears. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larissa, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, hello, everybody. <clears throat> it's nice to be back. Uh, uh, as I said, I would be, I, I move away from the two lectures I'd done before, which were at a very, you know, grand level of children's literature. And now I'm moving up to a kind of macro level. Uh, of uh, looking at reading in all its forms. Uh, I'll just try to share my screen, see if that works. Yeah, can everybody see that? Okay. Yes, we can. Super, super. Okay. Um, so, uh, as Larissa said, the, my talk today will be uh, about the evolution of reading in the age of digital technology. Uh, let me tell you a little about, about the background of this talk. I was approached um, a while ago uh, to get involved in a research group. Um, uh, it was based on uh, this, I just, this book that I'd written. Uh, some of you may have read it, Literary Reading, Cognition and Emotion. Um, some people had read that book and they approached me to get involved in, the, in this project. It was run from the European Union and the person in charge was a lady called Anna Mangan from uh, Norway, from the University of Stavanger. And it was a group of about 60 people. And what made it quite unique, we were looking at reading, the evolution of reading in the age of digitization. They'd asked uh, linguists like myself and literary people, but also psychologists and neuroscientists and uh, computer scientists and uh, all kinds of people were involved. And we met up on many occasions and we did studies together in smaller groups and the thing ran for five years and it was very inspirational. Um, it's finished now. Uh, at the end, uh, I'll show you some points from the final declaration and there's also a link where you can uh, check it out. But it was great to work in, in interdisciplinary with people uh, from the harder sciences to look at um, uh, how reading is evolving and how it might evolve and what's happening and what are the dangers and the, of the speed that which uh, uh, reading is uh, is evolving. I know in my previous session in the Q and A, I spoke to a, a, a colleague, a lady who was telling me about her granddaughter uh, who doesn't read. She just does, uh, you know, memes and, uh, you know, the great, uh, the great fear of that. And this kind of ties in with that a little bit. So, as I said, this was the book that I wrote that, um, that kind of got me involved in that, in that research group. Uh, and that book is about a number of things. Um, here are just some of them. It was about the aspects of the, the literary reading experience. And he looked at uh, numerous things like the role of the place and the location. And I'm going to say quite a bit about that in this talk. It also looked at the role of the medium, uh, the role of time, uh, the role of the style of the, the, the writing, the role of structure. I think somebody's still got their microphone on. <laughs> uh, the role of themes in, uh, in, um, in uh, stories and also the cognitive side. So how people were feeling before they started to read and what kind of factors had an impact on that, uh, their mood and their emotions. So this is what the book looked at, but I'm just gonna focus a little bit on the role of place and location. Um, we all love to read, don't we? And uh, you probably read in a location like this, uh, in bed or on in a comfy chair or in a comfy sofa. Uh, we did a study that I'll show you a little bit later where uh, this seemed to be confirmed. Uh, but there are other places where people can read too. Um, I also like to read outdoors, for example, you know, on a sunny day, sitting uh, in a nice uh, field or something like that, as long as you have a good chair, of course. Uh, uh, but the sun on your face or on a terrace or something like that. 
but there are some um, some odd uh, kinds of reading here. Uh, here's somebody reading in uh, in the swimming pool, uh, and there are even people who read on the bicycle, uh, which is uh, quite strange. Uh, I twenty years ago, I even saw people in the Netherlands reading while they were cycling. Of course, these days with people with their mobile phones, people are looking at their phones all the time while they're cycling. Uh, certainly here in the Netherlands, but back then it was very rare. Uh, to see people doing things like that, but people did do it. Um, not only do people read while swimming and while cycling, they also read while walking, sometimes while driving, well, hopefully when they're stationary, not when they're actually moving. Uh, here are some children uh, on a trampoline reading. That, that must be very uncomfortable. And here's a boy reading a book while he's climbing a wall. Uh, and there are some really strange examples. I'm only going to show you one. Some of them are not really uh, fit for publication, but this one is. Uh, here's a, 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 young, uh, a young boy upside down reading. So there's no fixed uh, kind of um, holes for your body to place itself in to read, uh, although the, the so-called reading in bed or in the comfy chair on a couch, that, that, that does dominate. Um, so that's just a little bit of uh, background to get us going. What is today's session going to be about? Well, um, we're going to look at four different things, all connected, of course. We're going to look at uh, where and when did reading begin? Now, I'm sure some of you know this already, so it's more of a refresher. Um, where is reading now? You know, uh, anno uh, uh, 2022. How might reading evolve in the coming 100 years, the coming century, with the advent of digital technologies? And what effects might this evolution have on the nature of things like human memory and comprehension and emotion? And I'll be looking to some of the, the outcomes from some of the studies that we did with the uh, Stavanger group uh, to, uh, to draw that, but also drawing on some of my own studies as well. So where and when did reading begin? So how did reading start? Where did it come from? How has it evolved over time since then? Uh, as I said, for many of you, this is just a refresher, but it's, 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 good, it's good to realize uh, that it's, it's not something that's been there forever. So uh, most scholars agree that um, reading goes back to the Sumerians. Uh, these were people living in Mesopotamia some 5,000 years ago. And here's a clay tablet in a cuneiform um, script. Essentially, um, it, was, it was developed as a method of cognitive offload. Um, if you couldn't remember, if you were selling some goats or some sheep or, some, or anything really, and you need to remember who owed you what, you would write it down with, um, by making some signs, some very basic pictograms, on a piece of uh, clay, which would then harden, so that you remember who owed you what money for what item that you'd sold them. And this is, uh, so it has like a, uh, an economic, a mercantile uh, side to it, but this is how uh, reading, uh, writing and reading started. Uh, it's not very romantic, I know, but, uh, but this is how it all uh, got off the ground. So 5,000 years ago, we weren't reading at all. Um, which just shows how adaptable the human brain is uh, for, um, you know, um, decoding symbols, whether they be pictograms or more uh, symbols like, uh, like I used in the West, um, for uh, representing concepts and, uh, and the semantic load and the, and the such like. Jumping ahead uh, thousands of years, uh, we come in the classical age and of course, People then are writing uh, using uh, styluses. Uh, first, they were scratching on, uh, on wax tablets, and then they're writing using kind of proto inks on the scrolls. So not books, people are using scrolls. Um, the paper, uh, of course, comes from papyrus uh, originally. Uh, there are a lot of uh, papyrus books still uh, still in uh, in some libraries, uh, but slowly but surely papyrus gets replaced by by another paper medium, parchment or velum, which are essentially animal skins. 
um, <clears throat> just to reflect on those um, um, libraries of the ancient world, libraries like the ones at Alexandria and at Pergamon, um, where there'd be thousands and thousands of scrolls. Um, of course, reading in those days was done aloud. That's something we also don't think about today. Usually when we read, we read silently. But that only started probably about 2000 years ago, silent reading. And it was done because we could uh, read quicker. It was kind of um, civil servants who would, uh, who would read quicker. There's a, there's a great text, um, St. Augustus. Uh, so that must be third century AD. And he's writing about his mentor, who is uh, Ambrose in Milan. He's the Bishop of Milan. And he writes something like, um, uh, Ambrose was reading, but he was silent. His lips moved, but no words came out. <clears throat> and we walked up to him and walked around him, but he didn't see us. And then we left the room. So he's completely shocked that uh, Ambrose is able to read silently while, while they're looking, because everybody reads aloud. So those old libraries wouldn't be, uh, there would be no uh, quiet police signs like there are today. They'd be very, very, very noisy. So you've got to think that, you know, what we take for granted, silent reading, is, is just a, a phenomenon that's been around for 2,000 years. You still see reading aloud, of course, in, in, uh, in several religions, in, uh, in Judaism and is, in Islam. Uh, the holy texts are still read aloud, usually with a, a moving body, you know, uh, in tempo with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the verse and also to help remember the verse. So, uh, yeah, an awful lot has changed. So what happens after the, um, after the um, uh, ancient period, the classical period? Well, the only books that are around are in monasteries, really, uh, being written and illustrated by, uh, by monks. And it's not until the invention of the printing press that, um, that uh, books become more widespread. And this is in the 15th century Gutenberg. But even then, books are still for the, the wealthy few, you know, personal libraries. Um, I was recently at Samuel Pepys's library in Cambridge. He's a, a picture of it. And he collected more than 3,000 3, volumes over his lifetime. But he was an incredibly wealthy man. And he was able to donate them. But for the vast majority of people, they never, never saw a book at all. So when we think of books today, and certainly when we think of novels, we think of the paperback, don't we? You know, we love to bend it. We love to fold it. We love to smell it. We love to hold it in our hands. Uh, but they've only been around for 100 years. Now, that's incredible to think. You know, people say, uh, you know, I couldn't live without my paperbacks. Um, but again, they came about as a, as an accident, really people were traveling on the trains and they wanted something to engage them for the journey. So Penguin, uh, together with Woolworths started to, uh, to sell them, uh, at first they only had about 12 titles and they'd be, uh, next to the fruit. If people wanted an apple or something like that, or a cup of tea, uh, when they were traveling. So even something like the paperback, which some of my students can imagine ever disappearing, it's only been here for a hundred years. And you know, in a hundred years time, it may be gone again. It's very uh, ephemeral, uh, even if these things seem very central to us at this moment in time. And that's a very, very quick, very broad uh, history of, uh, of reading. It's uh, essentially, it's a very new phenomenon. We've only done it for 5,000 years. Uh, you know, in terms of the, the development of the human brain, that's a tiny, tiny blip. So where is reading now uh, in the year 2022? Well, most, um, most experts in this field would say that we're in this hybrid state. Uh, we've got print in books. But we've also got pixels, you know, books and screens. And it's interesting even just to look at what's happened in the past 25, uh, 30 years. Um, when uh, computers became quite prevalent in the 1990s, uh, the book, the death of the book was announced. It's going to go, you know, in 10 years, we won't, there'll be no books anymore, people were saying. Uh, but the book hung on in there. And um, 
in 2007, uh, Amazon launched its Kindle, its e-reader, and it also had a new technology. It had uh, e-ink, which made it easy on your eyes to read, not like LED, which uh, uh, causes a lot of uh, uh, eye fatigue. And this was definitely the end of the book. You know, in 10 years time after 2007, there'd be no, no book. Uh, however, the book is proving to be quite uh, resilient. And the number of studies and a number of uh, newspaper reports based on large studies are showing that the book, even bookshops are quite resilient. OK, some have gone, uh, but online uh, sales of books are very stable. And in fact, you know, um, during the lockdown, during the COVID lockdown, they increased and they were in the process of increasing. So the idea that they're disappearing is uh, is is certainly not true. Um, I think we're in a very early stage yet. Like I said, this discussion's only been ongoing for about 25 or 30 years. Uh, but the book is very, very resilient indeed. Uh, perhaps ironically, uh, the thing that is dying is the e-reader. Uh, in fact, it was announced that it was dying in, uh, in 2019. It never really took off. It was relatively niche. It was bought by, there were only three or four different types. It was bought usually by um, middle-class, um, uh, middle-aged people. Young people never warm to it, really. Um, I've done some service with my students, and they only use an e-reader, usually in the summer when they're traveling, and then they borrow their parents, and they download lots of, um, lots of the books on there so they can read them, and they don't have to carry them in their rucksack, that kind of convenience thing. But actually buying it as a as a, a device to use and uh, that would replace print and replace books. It just hasn't happened. And the e-reader is on its way out. I mean, this very morning I wanted to buy um, um, a version of a, a critical thinking book that I'm using for, a, um, uh, for a, a, an experiment we're doing. And uh, it was the latest version. And I could only get it by downloading it. Now I was under the impression I could download it to my desktop but I had to go through this very convoluted route of the Kobo reader. Uh, and they were trying to force me to buy this reader, which is ridiculous. You know, that's how desperate they are now. Uh, no, the, the, the book hasn't died, but the e-reader has. So um, there have been attempts to save it. There have been attempts to to transfer the reading uh, of books from e-readers onto mobile phones. Um, and then screens have gotten bigger on mobile phones to try and accommodate the graphics, but also uh, reading as well. Uh, people have said, you know, the ergonomics, we don't like devices because you can't bend them, you can't fold them uh, as you can uh, um, a paperback book. Uh, well, um, in recent years, uh, Samsung especially has started to develop bendable phones, not for reading, that's not the primary thing. They, they, they're bendable so that when you drop them, they don't break. That was the, uh, that was the driving force behind the technology. Uh, but um, it's not really increasing sales uh, if you can bend your screen uh, and read a book and get more comfortable in your, in your chair. That doesn't seem to be working. So the ergonomics, even though they've tried to address that, is not, uh, is not working. Uh, similarly, uh, a lot of people say they love the smell of books, especially old books, sometimes new books, but the smell is really important. Uh, now, you don't get the smell with an e-reader or with a, uh, with a tablet or with a, a mobile phone, but the marketers try to respond to that by developing, uh, on the one hand, you see on the left, different sprays you can spray your digital device with to make it smell like an old book or, or like a new book. Uh, and there are lots of candles uh, that smell of books as well that you can uh, that you can ignite while you're reading from your e-reader to try and make it uh, uh, smell as though you're in an old library or something like that. And it's strange because that smell is like vanilla, isn't it? And it's 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 essentially it's rotting the glue that's rotting. So it's not a very nice thing that you're smelling. But uh, these fragrances are trying to recreate that so that more people will invest in, in digital devices when they're reading, but it doesn't seem to be having uh, much effect at all. Um, as I said, I've done some studies uh, on, on these kind of uh, um, reading uh, questions 
in the recent past, in the past, you know, 10 years. Uh, together with a former student of mine, Esmeralda Bonn, uh, we wrote a chapter in this book on the locations and means of literary reading, where we looked at a huge group of people and asked them very basic questions in a, in a qualitative study about where do they prefer to read and why and on what kind of means and why. And we saw that people were still very traditional. They stuck to their um, reading in bed. They stuck to their comfy chair. If they were outside, it wasn't very complicated. They still like to read books. <clears throat> Students sometimes like to possess hardback books, but that was so that it would impress fellow students when they walked into their student room. Uh, but for actual reading, they still preferred, uh, they still preferred the, the paperbacks. Esmeralda and I did a follow-up study. There was a group in that subset that said they also did a lot of digital reading, and these were all students. So we thought, now we're going to take those and do some really in-depth questioning with them to see how, how digital they actually are. And that came out in this uh, publication, which just came out this year, actually. Uh, Devices, Settings and Distractions, a study of how students read literature. And I've just taken the abstract, which also includes uh, the, the findings, and I'll just run that through with you now. So the abstract for our chapter was, the question of how and where students read has been a subject of discussion, not least due to the rise of e-reading devices and an increased need for remote learning. Reports in mainstream media often report that there appears to be a decline in traditional ways of liter reading literature. You read these quite regularly. With this study, study, we test this assumption. We focus on the reading means and locations, asking how university students read literature electronically. We interviewed a sample of undergraduate students and asked them to fill out a survey. And remember, these were ones who had indicated already they, they do quite a bit of uh, electronic, uh, or they're open to uh, uh, engaging with electronic means. However, our findings indicated that students still engage with very traditional literary reading behavior. Uh, they do make use of novel literary reading locations and devices, but they mostly use digital devices out of necessity and aim for locations where reading is comfortable. So that example I gave, you know, in the summer, uh, traveling and not wanting to take lots of books or borrowing the e-reader of their father and mother and using it there, but they're still very, very traditional. Um, uh, furthermore, they're not what, what, the media has been calling post hybrid readers. These are readers who use um, many devices to cross read. You know, they may start a story in a book, may continue it on their mobile phone as they're traveling to work, may continue it on their, their laptop computer at work and then come all the way back again. So, what the study found that even these students who, young people who said that they were, um, in, inclined to engage with devices, even with this group, they're still traditional book readers and they still read in traditional locations. Recording. Okay, moving on to the third uh, part of this uh, talk. So how might reading evolve in the coming century with the advent of digital technologies? Because, you know, they're here and they're coming and there are going to be more of them. Now, I mentioned this last week, and I want to share the outcome of this with you. Um, I teach a, a, master, a group of master's students, honor students in uh, Utrecht every year. And I was doing a, a course on literacy. Uh, these are, honor students are very bright students, the top 10%. And um, I asked them a simple question. I said, how will we be reading 100 years from now and why? And I split them into two groups. In one group, there were the humanities and social sciences students. And in the other group, there's hard sciences and technology students. Now, the humanities students brainstormed for about 45 minutes, came up with lots of things, and they reported back to me. And they reported the following. They said, in 100 years' time, we're still going to be in this hybrid state between books and between screens. 
we're probably going to be doing more screens, but still books are going to be extremely prevalent. And I kind of like that answer. You know, I'm a, I'm a, a linguistics and literature person. I was saying, yeah, yeah, good, good. I think I agree with that. And then I asked the hard science and technology students to report. And they said to me, in 100 years time, we will no longer be reading. Yes, let that sink in. And I went into kind of denial. I said, no, that's complete rubbish. You know, uh, where's your evidence? And they, they came up with all kinds of ideas. Um, and I went home and I thought about it over the, over the weekend. I was out with my wife and kids at the beach and we were, I was walking along the beach. I was thinking about it. And the more I thought about it, the more I got worried. And the more I thought, well, maybe they're, what they're saying is true. And I started to think about things like, you know, um, 40, 30 years ago, there was no, hardly any email, you know, uh, 40 years ago, there was no internet. Uh, 20 years ago, there was no social media. Uh, how can we predict with accuracy what's going to be, a, what's going to be happening in a hundred years time? Because also technology is, is getting quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker. The, the, the more we're using computers to, to develop that technology and, and those predictions. So I came to the conclusion that what the, the humanities and social sciences students said, the thing I like so much, uh, that it's going to be roughly the same, that was impossible unless there's going to be some kind of, you know, a uh, huge uh, uh, event, uh, you know, global warming event where, where the, the world is, is, is knocked back a hundred years. But barring that, that scenario that, uh, that the humanities students sketched is just not going to happen. So what about the, the, the hard, student, hard sciences students? Well, one of them said the following to me. They said, I said, of course, people were reading. They said, well, it'd be, there will be people reading, of course. There'll be people reading, but it'd be very niche. Uh, they said, it's like, it's like people who thatch roofs today, you know. There are still thatchers who thatch roofs, but you know, the vast majority of people don't thatch. Then the vast majority of roofers can't thatch. And it's like people who still do crochet and, and kind of, you know, uh, old forms of knitting. It'll still happen. Reading will still occur but it'd be extremely niche. Um, another example uh, they pointed me to was, uh, was writing, because of course, if reading goes, writing will go as well. And they said, oh, you know, we have uh, robots can write anything you want. Uh, it's not a problem. They can do any kind of handwriting, just put it in orally and it'll come out. And you can fake letters. You can, uh, you can put lots of your own style and letters and themes into a database and the computer will fake a letter and it'd be very close to uh, to uh to who you are i was watching a program the other night about uh um computers who can uh produce a kandinsky and uh because they've seen lots of kandinsky's and then if you put three, four Kandinsky's in front of people and say, which are the real Kandinsky's and which are, are the ones done by computers? Very few people can actually work it out. They have, people have got a grasp of the Kandinsky style, um, but of course um, the computer can get an even better grasp by using its databases. Um, Something else uh, they pointed to me is um, uh, Elon Musk is uh, pursuing uh, his Neuralink. These are brain implants, brain implant technology. Of course, for now, it's to overcome things like uh, impairment. If you've lost uh, the use of uh, certain limbs, that uh, it can re-engage limbs and the like. Uh, but in the future, who knows what kind of uh, links those kind of uh, uh, implants can make. Um, I remember seeing in a, in a science fiction film that somebody had like a, a port in the back of his head and they could upload all kinds of information in a, you know, in a millisecond. Maybe you can upload a book uh, if that kind of science fiction were to become science fact. And people like Musk with their billions and billions uh, able to push these technologies. And in a way, uh, I don't know if you have friends who have this kind of technology. I've got, we don't have it at home. We're still quite old fashioned, but I have a lot of uh, friends who uh, have voice uh, recognition software in their house. They just tell the Google boxes to, um, 
to turn things on. And they say things like, uh, yeah, Google, I've got to drive up to Amsterdam. Are there traffic jams at the moment? And Google will tell them if there are traffic jams. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite extraordinary, you know, that uh, writing things is disappearing quickly. Um, and speaking is, is something that, uh, that is, uh, is becoming quite normal. I mean, even I downloaded a new ver software version for my sat nav in my car, and I like to program it, uh, and I like to, uh, you know, follow its instruction. But it constantly tries to switch me on to voice recognition software. Uh, if I'm speaking to some my wife in the car, it'll interrupt it and say, can I switch to voice rec recognition software? It doesn't want me typing things in anymore, addresses where I want to go. It just wants me to speak to it. It wants to override all kinds of writing and typing whatsoever. And I have to constantly say, no, I don't want that. No, I don't want that. So with every download, it's going to become more and more difficult. So I'm not going to be able to, uh, to escape a stopping writing. So the question is, um, what can we realist realistically expect in the short term if writing and reading are really on the way out? Um, something else I, 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 I should have mentioned is, uh, you know, literacy levels. Children are, are reading less and less and less. We had the example from the, uh, the colleague uh, uh, last time I gave a lecture, you know, uh, even in, you know, here in the Netherlands, it's slumped. Um, some children won't read more than uh, 300 words, you know, uh, students trying to get them to, to read a, a 7,000 word essay. I mean, it's gone really quickly. 10 years ago, it wasn't a problem. And now it is. Um, so things are moving quite, uh, quite quickly at a pace that's, that's disturbing. Uh, but I'm the kind of person, you know, even though I don't like what's happening, um, it's good to have some meta-awareness of, of what we need to do. And I'm going to be speaking about that right at the end uh, to kind of cushion the blow. So what can we do? What can we expect in the short term? Well, I think we're going back. If we're getting rid of, of reading and writing in the coming years, two things that, that are not going to go away are speaking and listening. Uh, so maybe we've got more of the return of the rhetorician, more of the return of the storyteller, and more of the return of the listeners and the hearers. Uh, you know, going right away uh, to my first uh, presentation about uh, uh, Julia Donaldson and the Gruffalo and how she's a real, uh, an oral storyteller. Maybe that's the direction we're going in. Maybe we're going from writing to speaking and from reading to listening. And that takes us back probably where we were 5,000 years ago before uh, we needed to make those little marks in the clay to work out what we'd sold to whom and who owed us what. And some people have argued, look, there are some advantages of this. I mean, there are vast swathes of, of the world's population who are illiterate and as a result are, you know, uh, at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to, um, to you know, chances in society. Uh, for example, I read recently that the countries in sub-Saharan Africa uh, Africa, uh, you know, 40% illiteracy rate still. Um, if, um, if reading were to be abolished, then that would be a boost. That would be a kind of a leveling up because then we'd just be relying on listening and speaking. It's just an idea. So I do think that, that storytelling and the ability to speak well, uh, rhetorically and persuasively, I think that's going to make uh, a bit of a comeback. Something else in the very, very immediate short term we see that's happening is the massive sales in audiobooks. Uh, and this was happening before COVID. People are listening more to stories. And audiobooks are something that came out on, on cassette tapes. Remember about, uh, about 40 years ago, 40, 50 years ago, cassette tapes with stories on, and then it just disappeared. But it's really come back with a vengeance. And the sales of audiobooks have actually skyrocketed even before COVID. Um, uh, here's a, an article uh, from The Guardian uh, from August uh, 2020. 
and referring to COVID, the question they posed was, and I've written it down here, why have audiobooks done so well during lockdown, particularly given that no one is, is commuting anymore, nobody's going to work, everybody was working from home. And this is what Duncan Honeyman said. He's a senior commissioning uh, editor at Penguin. He said, being read to is a really intimate and comforting thing, a human connection at a time when a lot of people are feeling isolated from one another. Now, that second part focuses on COVID, but the first part being read to is a really intimate and comforting thing. That's something that goes back with humans for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. You know, uh, somebody, the storyteller around the campfire, uh, we still we still warm to that. We're still drawn uh, to that. And at the very bottom, there's a, a point here about the practicalities of uh, listening rather than reading. Uh, Duncan Honeyman added, you can buy and download a whole digital audiobook in an instant. So you can start listening immediately and you can multitask. So you can listen on your daily exercise or while you're cooking or doing the housework. Uh, a girl nearly bumped into us while we were cycling to school a couple of days ago and she had her earphones on and she stopped because she, I said, what are you doing? What are you listening to? She said, I'm listening to a book. <laughs> so uh, I felt like not, uh, not saying anything else. So, you know, even school kids uh, are cycling to school uh, are listening to books. So this is what's happening now. This is reality. Um, people are listening a lot more than reading. And I think that people are going to be speaking a lot more than writing. I want to uh, go back to uh, that report, that study I said I was, to, I was working on with, uh, with all those colleagues. It was from about 2014 to uh, 2019 it ran. So this final section, what effects might this evolution have on the nature of human memory and comprehension and emotion? Because that's what we were actually looking at. Now I brought, I've, I've pulled out some of the findings and I've put them on a number of slides. So here's some of the findings of the, the Stavanger Declaration on the Future of Reading. One, readers are more likely to be overconfident about their comprehension abilities when they're reading digitally than when they're reading print, in particular, when they're under time pressure. This leads to more skimming and less concentration on reading matter. What we saw time and time again is uh, when people, are, young people, especially are reading digitally, they don't read the text as well as when they're reading it on paper. Uh, we've had a lot of eye tracking studies about when you're reading on paper, you're going like regressions and stop starts and saccades. But when you're reading digitally, they're going like this. You know, they're really just scanning. Uh, and that means that the content is not going in. And that's not good. Um, especially when it comes to books that are important or documents that are important. So digital reading is having that effect. Uh, the second point, a meta study of 54 studies with more than 170,000 participants demonstrated that comprehension on long form informational text is stronger when reading on paper than on screens, and particularly when the reader is under time pressure. So this is even a larger study of, of the, the previous one. Although interesting, they didn't find too many effects when they looked at narrative text. So maybe this might be something that's good for literary reading, uh, but not for informative text. This is, we, we need to do more research on this. This is something that uh, was flagged for having to, to be researched more deeply. Uh, point three, contrary to expectations about the behavior of so-called digital natives, such screen inferiority effects compared to paper, they've increased rather than decreasing over time, regardless of age group or prior experience with digital environments. So digital readers are actually reading worse. They're, 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 they're scanning more quicker and, 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 and less and less is going. So they're not becoming accustomed to reading digitally and getting more out of it. They're actually becoming worse over time across all age groups. And we, involve, we observe that our embodied cognition, that is how and what we learn and know 
uh, and can depend on features in the entire body and the context, how that may contribute to differences between reading on paper and on screen in terms of comprehension and retention. Really think that that's a, an important factor and that's being really underestimated by all kinds of educators. So, what are some, uh, it's coming, it's happening. We can't stop it. Uh, there are two secondary schools in my, in my town and one has announced they're doing all the reading on digital devices to get rid of all the books. Uh, the only thing I can do is to send my kids to the other school, but who knows how long will they uh, uh, use books? And will I then have to look for a, a school outside of books? So it's coming, it really is coming. So how can we have like a managed transition or an informed transition, one that doesn't impact on, on reading comprehension and things like that. Well, it remains really important that schools and school libraries continue to motivate students to read paper books and to set time aside for it in the curriculum. Uh, this is a recommendation we gave to schools. And uh, two countries really took on these recommendations quite a lot. That was Norway and Germany. They're really looking at our recommendations in, in, in quite a lot of detail. The second one was students should be taught strategies that they can use to master deep reading and high level reading processes on digital devices. How they're reading now digitally is, is not good enough. The, that scanning is not good enough. They have to learn how to read. We don't know how this is gonna, uh, uh, what form this is gonna take, uh, but that has to change. And teachers and educators need to be made aware that rapid and indiscriminate swaps for print and paper and pencils with digital technologies in education, these are not neutral decisions. These do have effects. Uh, so unless it's accompanied by careful developed digital learning tools and strategies, this is gonna cause a setback in the developmental skills of reading comprehension at, at school and also things like emerging critical thinking skills. And finally, uh, the arts and the social sciences and the hard science and the technological sciences, they've got to work together with politicians and policymakers and industry to find appropriate solutions. Because if we don't, we're going to have a huge problem. We're going to make the switch too quickly to digital and people are not going to be able to comprehend what they're reading. So there's a lot of work for us to do. Uh, this is my final slide because I'd like to have so quite a, I wanted to restrict this to 45 minutes. So we have quite a bit of discussion. I think it's a topic where we can, uh, we can discuss quite a lot. I'm going to send you a, a, a chapter uh, uh, later this evening when I PDF this and send it to Olga. It's this chapter of paper and pixels reading in flux that appeared in this book, Speaking the Past heritage discourse and publishing in the digital age. So you can read this, it's far more in depth than my talk today. It'll give you more background. And I've included it on this final slide, uh, which also includes the two studies I, I mentioned and the declaration, which you can find online uh, if you're interested, uh, the Stavanger Declaration, uh, about how serious uh, the situation is and how we can't stop it, but we need to manage it. We need to manage and mitigate its impact. Uh, and also perhaps accept that reading and writing are unfortunately going to slowly uh, disappear. But we still have speaking and we still have listening. So working on those rhetorical and those storytelling skills is gonna be uh, very important for linguists as we, uh, as we move forward, I think. Okay, that's the end of my uh, talk. I'm, uh, I'd welcome any questions. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Yes, questions are welcome. Let us get to question and answer session. Arthur Grantovich, you're welcome. Uh, it, it, please switch on your microphone. My mic, I guess. Yes, yes, it's okay. Do, do you hear me? I do, I yes, do. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Michael, for an informative, promising, and a little bit optimistic lecture. <laughs> but, but unfortunately, I will not be a witness uh, to future predictions of how we'll be reading in 21-22. That there was a question you posted to your master students. Yes. But uh, during the past decades, new um, multimodal forms of reading made their appearance, but 
written text has also undergone substantial changes and is now increasingly performed with digital screen technologies such as uh, smartphones, laptops, mm -hmm. iPads, yes, e-readers. So as screens are replacing paper, uh, digitization is influencing reading and uh, um, uh, literacy activities almost everywhere. Mm -hmm. So in kindergartens, schools, mm -hmm. and in higher education. So in this case, I've got some questions. Well, only two questions. Question one, does, uh, no, no, do papers and screens affect cognitive outcomes such as recall and comprehension? The answer to that is yes. There are yes. many studies that show that recall and long-term memory uh, suffer when reading uh, in a digital form compared to print. Mm -hmm. There are quite a few studies on that. Yes, and uh, the second one, how does the growing digital infrastructure change the social position of books and other texts and that of reading in general, but bearing in mind that reading is human technology interaction? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, that's a very good question, and it's, it's, it's difficult to predict. I mean... Um, yeah. Um, I was analyzing a, 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 an inaugural lecture by um, an American president uh, with my students recently, and they said, you know, maybe in 100 years time, the presidents won't have inaugural speeches, maybe it'll just be a meme. And I thought, oh, my goodness, uh, that could perhaps it's probably more something more reductive than a meme. Um, so it's very difficult to predict. But um, it has been rewarding to see that books have remained quite stable uh, and have beaten off uh, uh, like the e-reader, you know, even though the e-reader said that the books were going to go. Uh, so I think there's still a place for books, uh, but it's down, it's down to our, 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 our students and our children and to us as parents to keep them reading, keep them engaged with books and read aloud to them, you know, that's uh, you know the first lecture I started with with Julia Donaldson and the Gruffalo. Get yes, them, yes. Get them, give okay. them a love for reading, and as they move forward, and inevitably, you know, uh, digital interfaces are going to become more and more and more prevalent in the household, in our lives, uh, and it, I don't know. I mean, nobody can say where that's going to take reading, but there is a chance that uh, that will be doing far more listening. Uh, then we're doing reading. I mean, at the moment, there are bedtime stories for kids. Um, and <clears throat> I was speaking to somebody who, who developed some of this software. And he says, yeah, we just have general voices at the moment. We can have the, the computer or we can have uh, uh, just general voices. He said we can even train the software very quickly to speak in the voice of the mother or father. But we're not doing that yet because we think it's unethical. It was, but but it did, we're not that far away from the from the computer just pretending to be the father or the mother, um, and then and then you know reading aloud to your children has, has gone as well. So it, the onus is on us to to keep that going, and especially when 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 we see that reading from screens not only impacts on on retention and memory, but also on on comprehension. What is there? Uh, and until we get some real good strategies uh, for for reading on screens um, and, and things like e-ink could be could be something we could move towards, but it's extremely expensive. Um, and there's been lots of studies about how how, you know, eye fatigue kicks in with uh, with the LED uh, back screen as well. But I'm sure technology will 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 address it in the in the future. Uh, I just don't know how. Yes, it's difficult to predict. Yes, thank you very much. But I usually say time will show. Maybe rain, maybe uh, maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe rain, maybe snow. Who knows? Yeah, that's thank quite you. true. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for your questions. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, dear guests, any more questions, please? Olga Petrovna, you're welcome. Uh, I would like to uh, just. I would like to sound a little bit sentimental. <laughs> because, you know, I think hard science people are really very pragmatic and sometimes uh, they predict things, but uh, people in humanities, though less pragmatic, sometimes feel things better. 
-hmm. And that's my hope. And uh, I would like to give two small examples. Well, from the past, uh, very near, very future, uh, very near past, and just some some past of the Soviet Union, Reggie. So uh, there was a movie, I don't remember how many years ago, maybe 30, uh, that was, it was a, an Oscar winning movie, mm -hmm. which was called Moscow Doesn't Believe Tears. And one of the personages there was a TV operator, just TV operator. Mm -hmm. He uttered a phrase that was made a kind of catchphrase. There won't be any theater very soon. TV will take over. And what we have now, and I hope that theater, theater is eternal. There is one more example which makes me a bit more optimistic. During this COVID, COVID period last year, uh, the Ukrainian government uh, initiated the so-called e-support. That is a financial support uh, that you could get via uh, the program DIA, via your gadgets. And it was like 100 grivnas or something, right? 1, so people, yeah, people were um, 1,000 grivna, yeah. Uh, people were allowed, they were given uh, a, a scope uh, of, uh, of a range of opportunities mm -hmm. where they could spend this money electronically, right? Mm -hmm. And the strange thing was that the majority of people used this money for buying books mm. via internet, but for buying books. It was Sort of paper books, not electronic books. Yeah, books. not electronic books, yeah, but yeah. Uh, paper books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And there is also something that gives you hope. Yes, well, so. I've, got an, I've got another example. I mean, when uh, when television started as well, they also said that the radio was dead. Oh, and yeah. It, and, and it still continued, you know. Uh, it will be interesting. I think if we go back to those two statements by the by the students, of course, we don't know if the science students will be correct. We don't know. Yeah. But I, I think but the humanities students will probably not be correct. So the, the, the idea that, that nothing has changed in 100 years oh, time of course is, so. is, is, is not, uh, uh, even though I wanted to believe it as well, uh, <laughs> it's probably not, not likely given what has changed in, in, in recent times. Yeah. But you make some great points. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Let's wait just for 100 years more and we shall see. <laughs> <laughs> thank okay, you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, dear guests? Wait, wait, uh, Yolanda, okay. Uh, this hello. is Yolanda, everybody, hello. our friend from hello. Poland. Hello, Yolanda. Uh, hello. Uh, I have a question because uh, all your predictions were mostly for literature, so to say, right? Yes. Even you involved a science student in your research. Do you think that your predictions would be different for different text types? I mean, uh, about two weeks ago, I had a conversation with my students on the issue that you discussed today. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I asked them to read like five pages uh, for our next class. And the first thing they asked me was, do you have the audio file of that? Mm -hmm. And I was just, uh, mm. audio file. okay, I would understand the question if it was about literature, mm -hmm. but it was a very academic text. And that's why, my, why I've got the question. Actually, if you um, read some professional uh, journals, linguistic journals, they already also offer audio files, not only the written forms, uh, digital forms. So that's why the question, if you could just comment on that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I know, but you make some, uh, some good observations there. Yeah, there are more and more audio files with regard to uh, academic publications. And we have students as well who, who demand those uh, rather than uh, having to read because they have some kind of dyslexic disability. Uh, although, you know, these days everybody has dyslexia, so they all have access to them. You saw in the, uh, <clears throat> in the studies um, that we did um, with the, uh, the group um, in, uh, in Stavanger that um, 
the retention of co the comprehension and retention of concepts on inf informative text. Some of them were scientific texts. That was the one that really struggled, that really dropped down. Whereas the narrative seemed quite stable uh, across both uh, uh, paper and digital. So there seemed to be a, a difference there. So that's worrying uh, if students are reading academic papers uh, on digital devices. Uh, and this might also have uh, have uh, you know encourage more students to request audio files because like i say we're getting that now as well they'd rather listen to a paper or rather listen to a synopsis of a paper than to actually read it and i was saying that the, the literacy levels are dropping quite badly in the netherlands where we used to be in the, the pisa rankings the Netherlands used to be near the top, and now it's in the middle. It's dropped in six years uh, a lot, and all the predictions are that uh, it's going to continue to drop. Um, you know, so you're going to have young people who quite literally uh, are unable to read dense texts, uh, a longer text, just just cannot do it. You know, just like for example, they're not able to drive a car because they haven't passed the test. They just they'll be unable to read it, and I do see. Um, publishers uh, making digital auditory synopses of the main findings of papers available uh, for students to listen to rather than to read. I think that's the direction that uh, the publishing is going in, unfortunately. Yeah, in Poland, just to um, yeah. start it up, it's not only audio files, but frequently video files. Sorry, may I? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. May I? Of course, oh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> there were some technical problems with switching on. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. And I have a bit of philosophical question. Uh, you say reading will sooner or later, better later, um, die out. And texts will die out. Uh, listening and uh, retelling and telling uh, speaking will take the place of it. What will happen with Shakespeare and the like? Your prognosis. Well Shakespeare. I think well I think Shakespeare will 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 continue of course in uh, in which uh, form? Well performed in the oral form um or uh or in the spoken form. I'm actually rereading Shakespeare, but very few people actually read him these days. Uh, with the exception of, you know, people like me. Uh, but going to performances, that will still, I mean, I mean, the, the theatre is, is a theatre of storytelling and rhetoric that will, that will continue to flourish, I think. So whatever literature will be um, disposed of, and there will be only retelling. No, I think there'll be there'll be full there'll be I mean, if you look at the sales of audio books now, I mean, uh, people will listen to audio books, you know, that, that are 800 page books. Um, you know, Ulysses uh, was quite popular uh, by not 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 Homer's Ulysses, but James Joyce's Ulysses. Uh, people listening to it, you know, um, or while while they're doing their their exercising or while they're walking to the shops. Uh, Walking yeah. to the shops. Yeah. That's not the best way. What no, I know. <laughs> personally, me, I prefer to read Chekhov than to listen to anybody, the best of, of the artists, yes. the best of the actors. Yeah. But Chekhov is mine. Yeah. I like to read it with my eyes. And yes. My yeah, yeah, friends. yeah. Well, I'm, 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 I'm like you. I, I'm a, a real lover of reading and a lover of books. And I select my books carefully to read on certain occasions in certain places. Yeah. Uh, you know, but I'm, I'm part of the older generation now. And, uh, you know. Uh... There are two of us, you and me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank it's you. It's rather really pessimistic, good. but anyhow, thank you. We have a question from a younger generation. Valerie, you're welcome. What do you think about the situation? Uh, uh, so, yeah, speaking on behalf of the younger generation, <laughs> um, it's rather not a question, but a remark. Uh, first of all, like about the ways of reading, I mean, uh, for example, uh, we've talked about that a lot in my family, with my mom, with my dad, so because they are kind of like your generation. Um, and uh, we compared. And yes, 
for quite a long time, I, I was really troubled that it seems that I kind of read less, like less lit literature, less fiction than my parents did the same age. Um, but then I, I actually thought that um, comparing the information I have and like comparing the things I know and my parents knew uh, at my age, I actually know more and I'd say actually much more and like not only me as a person but representing the whole generation mm -hmm. because and like it's not that we it's not that we read less we read differently I'd say and for example lots of things yes yeah, sure sure I can read an article in a newspaper but also I can read kind of like an article with almost no words but with a lot of pictures I, it's still the same information when we when we say that reading is the only words like we restrict reading to kind of like, it's actually unjust to reading, uh, to say that it's only words we can read because pictures and uh, a lot of like schemes and uh, even memes actually like, do you know how many things you can learn from memes? Like, I mean, I love the love of the memes, for example, because they are great. And uh, dealing with memes about philosophy, you can actually learn a lot about that. And actually it's kind of, it is kind of reading, I'd say so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I suppose, it, of, of course, it's all falls under the reading umbrella. It's just not the, the decoding of uh, linguistic signs, uh, uh, you know, language uh, uh, in, in that sense. Um, I, think, I think you're right and you're saying that, that young people maybe know a little bit more in the breadth uh, than my generation, but that that's all down to the uh, the internet and the advent of the internet. I mean, when I was a kid, if we wanted to find out something, some facts, we'd have to go to an encyclopedia and look it up. Uh, and today you have Wikipedia and all kinds of other bits of information. And of course, when they first came out 20 years ago, they were awful. Uh, they were full of nonsense and, uh, and rubbish and half-truths and uh, but over the years, they've gotten uh, in, in increasingly better, you know, and, and cited. And uh, I still don't think they're as accurate as, as old fashioned uh, uh, encyclopedias, but they can. You, it's at a, you know, a fingertip away. So young people uh, can get access to uh, uh, information quicker and relatively accurate information these days. Although having said that, you know, there's, uh, there's so much fake news on the, uh, on, on the internet as well and so many trolls that um, that the danger is also that you will uh, you will end up uh, uh, reading something that's been written to manipulate you as well. So yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it, it's it, it's true and it's uh, it's it, it's problematic. And if I may, one more brief comment. Yes, of course. Uh, about like uh, you were saying that uh, it's harder for the young generation to read like long texts, uh, in-depth texts, and like actually. I know, like a year ago, maybe I was reading. I I opened a book and I was reading a page, and uh, I just understood that I actually cannot concentrate on a long page. I was like really terrified because, like, I mean, I'm doing humanities. I read a lot, and like yeah. from a childhood on, I read a lot, and still uh, having so much, so much going on, I really couldn't concentrate. So yeah. I actually I started paying attention to like that I really do open a book and read and not only because I mean, even I, I think compared to like uh, tech, uh, uh, how much I read, I may even read more than my parents at your generation, but it's like short things, like it's every second I do read, but it's like really only short things from everywhere to every topic. So that's be, like why it's then harder to concentrate on like yeah. a longer text. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, the, 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 the picture is quite mixed. That's the study that me and my colleague did of our own students. We saw that they still, students still read, they still read compared to the general population, you know, but they're kind of oddities. But even compared to the peers uh, 10 years ago, the vast majority of them str really struggled to, to read, you know, a 7,000 uh, word article. Uh, um, you see, we saw something appearing. Uh, uh, when we set the homework, it said T L D N R. Uh, and it stood for too long, did not read. Uh, 
Uh, and apparently this is very prevalent in the United States and even in the UK. Uh, students are just saying they can't read it. And at first I thought it was because they were lazy or stupid or both. But then I, uh, I, th I thought, no, well, they, they, just, they just can't. They just, they just can't. They don't have the concentration span. They don't have the intrinsic motivation. And it's similar to them not being able to drive a car. You know, they just can't. They just, they've just lost it or they never acquired it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a worry. If I may, uh, again, okay, uh, that I think that shows in how they speak as well, how they read, that shows in how they speak. They have very, uh, I like my students because I think they are really great, but they can't discuss things thoroughly. They give you just the main idea, the gist of a thing, but if you ask them to support their statement, to elaborate on that, they've got problems with that. Mm. Mm. And I think that reading really shows in how they speak. So yeah, yeah. Well, as I, as I, I showed, I think you're absolutely correct there, uh, Yolanta. Um, as I showed in, in previous uh, talks uh, about uh, acquiring literacy, you know, being read aloud to and reading yourself, that just expands your vocabulary and uh, and uh, you know the thirst for knowledge, uh, and it just rolls on from there. Um, I suppose what I have learned is that at first I was shocked that this was happening, you know, uh, uh, but now I, I really am in, in favor of, of trying to transition it in, in a way that's going to, you know, allow uh, young people to still engage with content in, in written form until that written form disappears, if it is going to disappear. But even then, you know, something that, that many people are very bad at as well is listening the art of listening you know uh if 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 reading and writing do disappear in the coming you know centuries your people are gonna have to learn to become good listeners again um many of my students you know interrupt each other sometimes even interrupt me they don't have the attention span to sit and listen to somebody speaking and to process it and then to respond to what they've said. Sometimes they're, they're thinking of, oh, this is what I want to say. This is what I want to say. And they're not even listening to you at all. So even listening is a, is a, is a skill that needs to be honed and trained as well as speaking, of course. I, I would say that as a professor of rhetoric, but. Uh... Are you there? Hello? Any more questions? <laughs> Yes, what you're saying in, indeed is kind of disturbing. There are so many problems and uh, lots depends on us as educators. Yeah. I, I, I have a question. Don't you think that, well, since we have to come back to this, well, uh, draw attention of our kids to the uh, that, uh, intimacy of uh, storytelling. Uh, so should we return to fairy tales as, um, well, mandatory probably um, reading for every family? Yeah. So they get I, used to reading. I think, I think we should. We should be engaging with texts, uh, not just because of the, the reading itself, but also because of the content. You know, uh, I mean, authors like Chekhov we mentioned today, all the wonderful authors that we, we learn so much from by engaging with. And goodness me, you know. Um, uh, but I'm very much in favor. I mean, I, I've, uh, courses where I train first year students to speak and it starts with telling stories you have to be able to tell you know like a fable mm -hmm. one of these fables yeah in an engaging way and many of them can't they've never told a story to anybody in their life before uh, but this is the first step to becoming an engaging public speaker to be able to hold people's attention uh, and also be aware of uh, of their needs as well so lots for us to do as educators, especially while working Exactly, with exactly, yes. It's, that's, that's good news in one way. <laughs> okay, we've got one more question from coming from Anna. You're welcome. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Hi, yes, Anna. Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, so as a mom to a two-year-old kid, I feel really disturbed. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, don't, don't be! I'm sure. I'm sure that you're going to read to your uh, to your uh, son, is it? And uh, and uh, your son will become a great avid reader. There will be. He'll be like one of those uh, those Thatchers who who can still read and uh, and uh, whereas many people around him can't. 
So I think that's one advantage of, of, of academics. We still pass that on to our children. Sorry, Anna, for interrupting. No, no worries. Uh, well, hopefully. But I still have a question to you. Do you think we are already deteriorating as humans? Because even if people resort to storytelling and listening, as you've already mentioned, uh, these skills are more difficult to to develop, right? Yeah. Uh, could be yeah. another contributing to illiteracy. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. You use the word de humans deteriorating. I don't know if you can say that. Uh, that's... Uh... A kind of a, a judgment, isn't it? Um, I don't know if it's deteriorating. Uh, like I said, the the, the 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 human brain managed to develop very, very. It's very plastic, of course, uh, uh, very quickly to accommodate reading. Uh, like I say, in five thousand years, uh, that we can, you know, read linguistic texts and and get all this imagery out of the semantic content. That's uh, that's amazing. You know, uh, the human brain is. Uh, is is so uh, elastic and so uh, quick at, uh, at, at picking up new um, new um, tasks, uh, but I don't think it's a, a degeneration. I think well, yes, we are going somewhere different. Um, I still think that there will always be need a need for communication and for stories and for persuasion and for emotional intelligence when it comes to uh, persuasion, uh, I think all that will still be uh, needed. And, you know, it's, it's not that reading is going to disappear overnight. I think writing may go first. Um, you know, to be honest, um, schools are, 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 some schools are struggling to, to teach the children how to write. And if schools are getting rid of, of pencils and paper, and are using computers, uh, then they're already typing, you know, they're already a step away from, uh, from, uh, from writing. Uh, and, you know, we used our hands to produce text for a long, you know, when we were chiseling on stone and then writing, you know, with all kinds of implements and then typing. Uh, but voice recognition software is so, is so good now. I mean, when it came out 20 years ago, it took ages for them to get used to the, the person's voice, but now you can train it in an afternoon. Um, uh, so you can write a book by speaking it. But again, that, that's also a skill because to actually speak the, uh, the, um, the lines in the way you want to speak them for a book, that's quite a skill. And, it's not, and that's something that would also have to be trained. Uh, I was giving a lecture the day on Winston Churchill, who used to uh, write his, his, his speeches that way. He had them dictated and he, he, he weighed the, the lines and the rhythm and the balance and the words he wanted to use. And then he'd just speak the, the line aloud and his secretary would type it. That, that's quite a skill as well. So, yeah, a lot of work for us, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you Any more questions, everybody? I have a question, if I may. Sure, sure. sure. Yeah, so uh, how do you think will being read to, rather than reading to ourselves, influence our communicative skills in terms of uh, prosodic means and prosodic skills? Because when we are reading to ourselves, yeah. we are actors. Uh, yes, we are yeah. reenacting the reading, different voices that we create in our yeah. mind, yeah. the rhythm, the pauses. And yeah. I don't like audiobooks because they're being read by someone else to me and creating all these pauses, these tones, yeah. uh, uh, or sometimes just the timbre of the reader. So yeah. will it influence these communicative skills of us not being able to express yeah. uh, our thoughts with the correct yeah. prosodic yeah. means? Or will it be beneficial? Because those readers, they're usually trained actors, public mm -hmm. speakers, mm -hmm. and they know better how to put those poses correctly or which tone yeah. to use. Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. Uh, uh, I don't have an answer. I can talk around it if you like. Uh, I think it needs to be studied. This is a nice, uh, a nice experiment that could be uh, that could be set up. I know that you're right that when we read silently, we hear our own prosody, we have our own intonation, we go at our own speed. Uh, and as I, I, I told you in a previous lecture, 
uh, there have been studies done, our auditory cortex is very, very active, just as active as when we're listening than when we're, when we're reading silently. So we are hearing uh, uh, something uh, definitely, uh, and that not hearing that could affect our communication and our prosody, absolutely, it could. You could argue that by engaging more in public speaking and training yourself that way can also maybe compensate for losing it that way. And you're right that when it comes to all audio books, they do choose um, actors who are, who are very good readers. Um, uh, when they first came out, they used to have the author reading the book, which was nice in some way, but sometimes the author didn't have a very engaging voice, so it didn't quite work. Uh, and now they have people like, do you know Stephen Fry? He's a British actor, you know, he's got a great voice. He's, uh, he could read anything and people just listen to it. And, you know, uh, and Alan Bennett and people like that, they've got great reading voices. And in a way, they, they kind of engage with you and, and send you into this like almost like childhood fetal state of, uh, of just enjoying the text, you know. Uh, so, yeah, there, there, are, there, are, there are pluses and there are minuses. And it would be very interesting to see if it does impact if it would impact on on the production the prosody production your communicative skills if you are only read to and, and no longer read silently to yourself yeah it's an interesting uh, question thank you thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. any more questions dear guests any comments ideas I have a comment. Um, you know, I would like to say there is a, a, a surprise uh, waiting for us because we are still anticipating joy. We are still in this process of mm -hmm. anticipation. And Michael, so we first planned three lectures in this cycle, but joy is still waiting for us somewhere and that's why Michael decided to bridge this gap and he uh, kindly suggested that he might have another lecture in this series of lectures uh, because we behaved well in fact <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, we arranged it as that uh, was Larissa Ivanovna just discussing it today uh, not long ago, that it might be uh, another Tuesday. Tuesday is a day of anticipating joy. <laughs> uh, the 31st of May, just on the brink of uh, spring and summer with us. So you are all welcome to one more lecture by Michael Burke. It is to be announced. It's just yeah. a surprise. I won't tell you the title. I don't know it is. <laughs> I don't know if Michael knows it. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe the, the end of this talk pushed us in a general direction when we're talking about, you know, rhetoric and oral culture. Yeah. Maybe that could be something uh, uh, I could go in that direction. I've got a number mm -hmm. of uh, papers I've written recently that I could turn into a presentation. Okay. That Thank you. Be so, so we have this wonderful project uh, uh, the end of May, and that might be a very good finishing touch to the academic year. This okay. this yeah. academic year, a bonus we all deserve. <laughs> yes, you um, certainly do. You certainly circumstances. Do. <laughs> Uh, so, so we will uh, uh, announce uh, uh, usually on uh, Facebook, on our website page of our department, um, the, the lecture to come. And uh, if there are no more questions, uh, I want also to mention that um, we will upload the recording of today's lecture on the YouTube uh, channel of our department. Uh, Give the link on uh, Facebook. And so, my, Michael, so, I think, will send me that chapter that you've yes. promised, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I will. I will. Okay. I'll PDF should... this. I saw there were a couple of typos in as well. I'll take those out, PDF it, and I'll send you the chapter as well. I'll okay. do that this evening. Thank you. I just, I will, uh, hold on just a second, I will uh, send the link to our YouTube channel, just in case. <laughs> so okay. the, will be uploaded on that channel. Okay. So thank you so much. We, thank we you very much, everybody. Think a lot. So the problem is disturbing and lots for us to do. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Yes. I said I was going to a meta level now of the, uh, and we'll come back a little bit and uh, and look at something else in the in the fourth and final lecture. We would appreciate anything. Indeed. Okay. Okay. Super. It's a pleasure for us. Yes. Okay.